we go into this part of the service of the breaking of bread. And we just ask for you to be with us. Many needs, as Tim has already mentioned, in this building, in this house today. Several needs. And we're going to bring them before your throne. Um, later on in the service, Lord, we ask that your eyes be upon us and that your, uh, your Holy Spirit directs us and anoints us to hear, teach, speak a living word today. We give you the praise, we give you the honor, we give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Just a few moments after we're finished this morning, we're going to uh, give you an opportunity, some of you, to come. I have several in our, our congregation that, uh, that are here this morning, as Tim has mentioned, that some of us are suffering ourselves physically, but uh, some of your loved ones uh, are suffering. And we want to we want to have special prayer for them this morning. Uh, might be something. There's probably a better time than now to uh, okay. Children's shirts. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Amber is going to be doing it. I, I didn't know anybody was here to do it, so I'm sorry. My apologies. Uh, proud of Amber and uh, Adam, their whole family. and Well, I'm proud of all of them. Um, but, uh, several of your members are, uh, it might not, what I was going to say is that, uh, I don't know who to approach about this, but maybe we could get some little cloths made that we would have here handy or buy them or whatever that we could anoint with oil and send them home to be with people and we could keep them, you know, uh, here in the pulpit because uh, it would be a good time for us to perhaps maybe anoint some cloths. And if you have a, uh, a loved one and you're going to have prayer this morning, you have something that we could anoint uh, you could bring it forth. Uh, we're going to go, this is our fifth, our fifth uh, part of uh, the Beatitudes, uh, the fifth message. It didn't start off to be a, a series. Uh, I started off with doing uh, just a uh, message one Sunday morning on the... Uh, Peacemakers, blessed are the peacemakers. But there are actually eight, so I thought, okay, the Lord inspired me, and uh, some other people have mentioned how they've enjoyed it, and I appreciate those compliments, as always. But I've enjoyed it likewise, but not only have I enjoyed it for the reason of preaching or, you know, anything of that nature. Because preaching is not the easiest thing in the world, whether you realize it or not. But I've learned a lot. I've learned a lot about myself and how to live my life. And I've, uh, after 40-some years of ministry, it's like I've never actually taken the time to preach on these. But we uh, went from being peacemakers, which is actually the next to the last, which would be there are eight Beatitudes, so then we went from, that would be the seventh one, but when then we went to the first one, which is being poor in spirit and uh, being meek and mourning. Uh, so now we're going to cover the fifth one today, which is uh, blessed are those who hunger and thirst after or for righteousness. So we're going to speak on the topic today, if you would, uh, Travis, bring it up. I'm going to ask you, are you hungry or are you thirsty? It's a story, and it's a true story, told of a businessman who decided to throw a party for uh, some of his clients. Because he was doing so well, he spared no expense. He hired the most expensive caterer in Chicago and rented out the McCormick Center. 
He paid an army of uniformed wait staff to serve his guests from gleaming silver from from gleaming silver trays. He commissioned an artisan to carve an ice sculpture of a swan and had it floating in a lake of punch. Engraved invitations were sent out in advance, inviting all of his friends to come, hand delivered by special messengers, couriers. And uh, in plenty of time for everyone to clear their calendars and attend this great event. But somehow, when the hour came for the party began, the host found himself in this large arena all by himself, alone. Not one guest bothered to come. Not even, at that time, Mayor Daly. After waiting an hour, the host asked his assistant to get the guest list and began making some phone calls. The first person his assistant called was very apologetic. She said she fully intended to come, but just as she was about to leave for the party, her realtor called to say that the offer she placed on a piece of property had been accepted, and they needed to close the deal. The, deci- the woman decided it was only prudent to take one last look at the property before signing the papers. She sincerely hoped the host would understand. The second person the assistant called was also deeply apologetic and a little embarrassed. I really meant to be there, he explained, but yesterday the the Toyota dealer called me to tell me that my new hybrid had finally arrived. You wouldn't believe how long the waiting list was for this car. Anyway, the dealer said I could take delivery on the car today And after waiting six months, I just had to take it for a last test drive. I was having so much fun showing it off to my friends that the party completely slipped my mind. I'm so sorry. The next person the assistant called didn't even bother to apologize. In fact, he was quite abrupt on the phone. He said that he and his wife had just come back from their honeymoon and didn't want to be bothered. It turns out they had just had their first fight as a married couple, were on the verge of making up and wanted to be alone. It went on like this, one call after another, until the assistant had called every name on the guest list. Everybody, it seemed, had some kind of excuse. When the assistant went back and reported the disappointing news, the host was understandingly angry. What am I supposed to do? The convention center was already booked, and the deposit was non-refundable. The food was already prepared, and the ice swan was already starting to melt. Suddenly, the host got a flash of inspiration. He remembered that on his way to the McCormick Center, he had passed a group of homeless people. He called his assistant over, go out there and tell them that there is a free meal for them here. He said it it didn't take long for word to spread on the street, and soon the room was filled. A crowd had gathered, some of them feeling unworthy and sheepishly going into the door. But even with these newcomers, there was still plenty of food. And most of it was in danger of going to waste. Looking at one of the street people enjoying the hors d'oeuvres, another flash of inspiration came across the businessman. Call the homeless shelters, he told his assistant. Tell them to bring all their people down here for dinner. In the meantime, the guest who had purchased the new car happened to drive drive past the McCormick Center on his way home. Feeling guilty, he decided to show up at the last minute. Because he had been out driving around in his new car 
all day. He didn't have time to change into his tuxedo. But he thought better later than ever when he first saw the ragged-looking crowd seating at the table. He thought, I must be in the wrong place. And he saw the host standing in the corner, the man did, and went over to him and to make his presence known instead of being happy to see his guest. The host was angry. He called for a security guard and had the guest ejected from the party. The host said, None of these who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. There's an old saying that goes like this. I'm sure that you've heard it before. You can lead a horse to the water, but you cannot make him drink. If we would... Bring up Matthew chapter 5, verses, verse 6, excuse me. Jesus said these words to his disciples. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. <coughs> There's a similar story in Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. In the parable of the great banquet that Jesus recorded. Let's go through that, Travis, if you would. It's kind of lengthy. And Jesus answered and spoke these words again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son, and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, that they would come. Again he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good. And the wedding was furnished with guests. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to his servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Last verse. For many are called, but few are chosen. Jesus makes a similar point. Just because the meal is prepared, there's no guarantee that anybody is going to eat. I never will forget, I made a long trip from West Virginia one time, took a friend of mine to visit my mom. My mom, uh, being from West Virginia, they have what is called West Virginia hospitality. And I'm the same way. Uh, I, I, when I cook, I don't cook five pork chops for five people. I probably am going to cook ten if there's five there, if there are five there. The reason why is that I don't want somebody wanting a second pork chop and being afraid to take the last one on the plate. And uh, I took this friend to be with my, to, to 
my mom's house in Toledo, Ohio. We went from West Virginia, had some business to conduct, and he went with me. And uh, he was quite a, if I may say, a finicky eater. And uh, my mom, the next morning after we arrived and we spent the night, she made this big breakfast for three people, two men and one widow lady. Gravy, biscuits, fried apples, fried potatoes, eggs, everything that you can imagine there. But Wes, oh, I said his name, I hope he's not watching. But he was one of those eaters that he, he ate, uh, he took little bites and he put his fork down and a little bite and he wouldn't, he didn't eat a whole lot. My mom was quite offended <laughs> to the point to where she said, I don't want you bringing him back here anymore. So uh, the meal is prepared, but there's no guarantee that people are going to eat it. In the parable, God is the host. Eternal life is the party, but not everyone who is invited is interested. We see that in our society today. There's a message for the church to ring out that the food has been prepared. And all you have to do is to come and eat. And all you have to do is to drink. Those today, there are people today that could be enjoying the greatest feast in their life. One important thing, the missing prerequisite is the same characteristics described by Jesus in the fourth beatitude. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. What does Jesus say in the beatitude to those who come seeking God's blessings? Before we can be blessed, Jesus says, number one, you have to be hungry. Now, I don't know how many of you, uh, you know, I've had trouble eating for the last two or three weeks. Well, I finally was able to go back on solid food. So I've been cooking everything I could imagine. There's stuffed pork chops last night and stuffed chicken breast the night before. And I've made eight quarts for two people of homemade vegetable soup at 3 o'clock in the morning. So everything I can think of, I'm cooking. And I, 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 I cooked it all night. I put it, in, I put it in the oven. I actually made my, my soup in the oven. And I woke up this morning and I smelled the aroma of, of homemade beef vegetable soup filling the house. So when the hunger came back, I had the hunger, but my stomach just wouldn't handle the food. So all of a sudden, now that I know I can eat, I'm making everything and anything I can to fill the, and to satisfy the hunger that I have inside of me. But right now, spiritually, and uh, there are so many people that have, they have access to be filled with the Spirit of God and to be filled with the goodness of God and to be filled with the mercy of God. But somehow or another, they're just not hungry for it. We've spoken about it in times past, and those that have been on the mission field here uh, from, from our church that, you know, in, in America we have churches on every corner that, uh, of our communities that are empty because somehow or another in America we feel like we have everything that we need. And our biggest concern, even as we uh, approach this presidential uh, cycle and we, we're going to be voting, most of the things that people are concerned about are such things as the economy and, and jobs and so on and so forth. But there's very little of a cry among Americans for an actual hunger to see God because there are empty pews and there are empty churches, empty programs because people don't want to come and, 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 and there seems to be a, somehow or another... Uh, a lack of hunger for God. 
We've got more money than we've ever had. We're in debt deeper than we've ever been. But I've told the story many times that how when we visited the Ukraine, the people are deprived and uh, they, they, uh, of, of the luxuries that we have here in America. And uh, they're in poverty stricken. And we would go to uh, soccer fields, no buildings, no stained glass, no steeples. And we would go to soccer fields and we would set up the sound system and, and do whatever we could. And I remember in one particular uh, uh, place that we went, there was a soccer field and some gentlemen were down there playing soccer. And at first they began to make a mockery of us. And there was one goat herder that was leading their goat, his goats across the, the field there. And, and there was no congregation, uh, a church, so to speak. <coughs> a few of us gathered there together, eight, 12 missionaries, and a few of the local people there from that church. And we began to preach, and we began to sing. And the next thing you know, people began to flock out, and they began to come, and they left, and the goat herder brought his goats by, and all of a sudden, the guys that were mocking us, the, that were playing soccer, they began to come, and they began to listen. And that night, I forget how many, but there was, a numer there was a large amount of people that gave their heart and life to Jesus Christ, and they surrendered to Jesus Christ. Why? Because they realized that they were empty. And sometimes, I think even we in the church, we, we, we're full of ourselves. We're full of things. We're full of what we want and what we like and what we dislike and, and what we expect and all those other things. And, you know, everything that's it's kind of selfish. But is there such a thing among our people? And I think there is. Is that that's the reason why? I'm, I'm feeling the anointing of the Holy Ghost here this morning. I feel like that when we begin as a people to be hungry and thirsty for God, that God once again will give us revival. But do we want that more than we want ourselves and our ways? Do we want it? God. Are we hungry for God? Are we thirsty for God? Do we want more of Him? Or are we just satisfied? <coughs> Anybody that knows, and we're always on a diet. I've been on a diet for 45 years. Sometimes I told Diana this morning, this is my fat man suit. Gained a little bit of my weight back, and I got on the scales this morning. I said, oh, no. Scales are going the wrong direction. Eating the right things is, is essential in life. Having a balanced meal and proper diet, it's, it's essential. You can live a healthier life. They tell you that. Doctors tell you that. And some of the things that I've, you know, been, uh, when I first, my diagnosis, prognosis, whatever you want to call it, when after they did all the work they did, they finally, it took them over a year to come up with what was actually wrong with me. Well, they probably just found a portion of what's wrong with me. The fact of the matter, there's a technical term. It's called ischemic colitis, and that's that's what I, that's what I have. So at first, the doctor, the nurse told me, well, you know, she she told me she said this is what you're going to have to do: no red sauce. In other words, no spaghetti sauce. Nothing red. Anything like that. And I said, you you have to understand, I'm not Italian. But those are my favorite type of, I could eat pizza every day of my life. And spaghetti sauce. And, and I thought, well, what about, <coughs> what about such things as salsa? <coughs> Spicy foods, no, you can't have that. Jalapenos, no. So then the doctor did the thing that he does, and then he comes out and tells me, this is what you do. And this was, I said, well, this, does that mean I have to limit my diet? And he said, these are the words he spoke to me. He said, he said, I said, what about spaghetti sauce? He says, you can eat spaghetti sauce. I thought, what's wrong with that nurse? <laughs> I said, what about, what about uh, salsa? 
He said, you can eat salsa. And he said, uh, I said, what, what about, uh, th- and this is the big one, I said, what about jalapenos? He said, he looked at me, this young guy, he said, look, he said, live your life. He said, eat what you want to eat. He said, just do it within moderation. That's the key word to a lot of things. But I don't know about you. There are certain things that I like better than, than I like other things. Uh, I, 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 you know, I just enjoy those certain types of foods. I, and I like almost everything. You can tell that. I like frog legs. I like escargot. I like all of those things. Uh, Diana, she's a little bit limited as to, here, since we've been here, I don't know those of you that I can tell on you. She, she, she would refer to, to Brussels sprouts as those little green jobs. Had no desire whatsoever to, and some people don't like Brussels sprouts. I love Bru- Brussels sprouts. I thought that I never, ever liked asparagus until I tried grilled asparagus. I love asparagus. So finally, I convinced her. I said, just try one, just just a little bite, please. Would you please try it? And she tried it, and guess what? She liked it. How many remember the old commercial of, I forget what cereal it was, that the three guys are sitting around and, Life cereal. And they said, give it to Mikey. He won't he won't eat it. He doesn't like anything. And Mikey sat down and he started eating the cereal. There's a point behind all of this. Deep down in each and every one of us, deep down in our if you've been serving the Lord 30, 40, 50, 60 years, there's still something that's kind of empty in us. If we don't feed that, we'll eventually die of spiritual malnutrition. In a world where starvation was daily an occurrence, a a daily occurrence, and the next meal was far from certain. Hunger must have seemed like an unlikely path to blessing. The fact that Jesus makes it clear that he is talking about a hunger for righteousness hardly clarifies things. It seems like he puts the emphasis in the wrong place. Shouldn't he have said, blessed are those who get righteousness? Think about it. He says, blessed are those, he could have said, blessed are those who get righteousness. But doesn't a hunger for for righteousness imply that there's a lack of righteousness? I, within myself, have no righteousness. As a matter of fact, the one writer puts it this way. That my righteousness as our filthy rags. But Jesus begins with hunger. Right away we see, <coughs> excuse me, that Jesus is talking about a realm where the order of things is very different from the order we're used to. In our thinking about righteousness, we'd rather dwell on what we have than on what we lack. But Jesus says, where his kingdom is concerned, it is better to come empty than full. And for good reason. Jesus knows that without hunger, we will have very little interest in righteousness. This is why The blessing in the Beatitudes is attached to hunger and thirst rather than righteousness. 
Jesus is pointing to a very fundamental misconception when it comes to the blessings of God. We think that righteousness is the condition we must be in to be blessed. But Jesus proposes something that's very radical. It turns our ideas about God and righteousness as blessings turned upside down. Jesus does not say righteousness is the condition of blessing. Jesus says righteousness is the blessing. Hunger is the precondition. So if you truly hunger and thirst for righteousness, you won't be interested in it. Does that make sense? If you truly hunger and, and thirst for righteousness, you won't be interested in it, even if Jesus were to send you an engraved invitation as the guy did for all of his guests. So God, by his goodness, paves the way for, for blessing by sending Jesus is the one that sends us hunger. God knows that spiritual hunger is a precondition to blessing. He also knows that when we are in denial about our condition, in other words, we come with the mindset that we have arrived. I have been in the church 40, 50 years. 60 years. I was saved when I was 15 years old. I gave my heart, I joined the church when I was 20 years old. I've done this. I've done that. I've paid my tithe. I've done all the good things. I gave to missions this morning. I did all of those good things. But still yet, there's a void. There's an empty. Do we feel like that we've arrived or do we feel like that we actually are hungry for righteousness? You know, my dad was a pastor and occasionally he would take me on visitation. He would take me with him when he visited church members and some of his friends and family and things of that nature. My mom might be back home doing something. It was a treat for me to go do something with my dad. And he had to take, occasionally take me with him. And I sat on the couch next to him. And he would talk to people. He talked to them about all kinds of di different subjects. But he taught me to be polite and keep my hands folded on my lap listening to conversations as an 8, 9, 10-year-old that I really wasn't interested in. It was an excruciatingly dull experience for a small boy, but I got to spend some time with my dad. At some point in the visit, the host or whoever we were visiting would maybe say something like this. They would say, would you like something to drink? We do that. You know, Dave came to the, it's only the right thing to do. I mean, it's, you know, Dave came here not too long ago and said, hey, you want a cup of coffee? And Diana went and whipped him up a cup of coffee. But my dad, I guess it was proper manners then, he said, that at some point in the visit, there would be a break in the monotony and somebody would ask me if I wanted something to drink. I long for that moment the way a prisoner longs to hear the sound of the key in the, prisoner, in the prison door. Maybe she's going to give me a soda. Maybe she's going to give me a glass of lemonade or something like that. But, my, uh, but unfortunately, <coughs> my dad had a very basic rule. I don't know where he got it from. But he would say, David, David Morris, he said, if the host offers you anything to eat or drink, he told me, you say, no thank you.
And then he said, if the host offers again, you accept. And I think to myself, what kind of rule is that? Maybe, just maybe, he didn't want me to appear greedy. Perhaps it has something to do with growing up during the Great Depression when he was younger. But they would say such things as this. Would you like a cookie? Would you like a glass of lemonade? And being obedient to my father, I would say, no, thank you. And what broke my heart many times was that sometimes they took me at my word. And they never offered it again. And they took the cookies away. But the fundamental problem with this little boy was that it was essentially a lie. And this is the problem that we face when it comes to spiritual hunger. Jesus says the blessing of righteousness comes only to those and hung, those who hunger and thirst for it. But our, but our natural state is one of denial. I'm going to try to get through this today and be as quick with it as possible. <laughs> So we need to accept, first of all, it's hard for us to do, especially when we've been in it for so long. Today, I ask you, do you feel righteous, or do you hunger for righteousness? Do you feel today empty? I'll confess to you today. The, on, the longer I'm in this, the more sermons I preach, the more messages I preach, I think the more hunger I get. Looking back over his time of ministry and all the great things that he achieved and he attained. Looking back over the churches he established, the missionary journeys, everything, the people that he won, the great experiences. There was something in the Apostle Paul that at the end of his journey he found himself still empty. Because it said, Paul, where are you on your journey? Of all the things that you've ever experienced, could you brag about where you've been and what you've done and everything that you've accomplished and everything? And he came right down to it and says, what, what is it that you're, what is the one thing that you're really at this juncture in your journey? What is the one thing that you're really wanting to see or that you're, you're wanting to do or accomplish more than anything else? You know what the Apostle Paul said? That I may know him. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Resurrection. What he was saying is that I, the Apostle Paul, am not full of myself. It's not me, it's not mine, it's not anything I've done, anything I've attained, anything I possess. He said, I'm empty.
And I still need Jesus. My religion is just religion. And it's dead without him. Before we can be blessed, we need to accept our emptiness. It is not enough to have the need. We need to know the full depth of that need. The language Jesus uses in the Beatitudes is the language of extreme need. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. It is no accident that Jesus compares our spiritual need to our most fundamental human experience. Nobody likes to be hungry. We need to eat. Gave reference to my mom. And <laughs> didn't know it. Lived quite a ways from her and there were a lot of circumstances. But she went to her she went into her, uh, when she, my sister passed away, and Diane and I became her caretaker. She, she, she didn't even weigh 120 pounds, and she was feeble. And she told me stories about, I, I, I had no idea. I don't know what that was. But, uh, uh, we we took her and we took her. She loved uh, Burlington Coat Factory. Was that the? She loved to shop there. Got her some new clothes. She began to eat. She began to gain weight. And every time I take her, I took her to the her doctor's visits and everything. She'd get on the scales and she'd turn around to me because oh, she was gaining weight. But she loved to eat. She was. Uh, I think, you know, as those of you that have ever had to, I became the parent. She was the, she was the child, and she was had been diagnosed being uh, diabetic. She never did have to take insulin, but she took met, metformin. Is that metformin? And uh, she loved to eat sweets. She she loved sweets. The day before she before I had to take her to the hospital, uh, we were making pinto beans, and uh, she came up to me and she said, "David, that that West Virginia draw." She said, "David," she said, "Do you mind if I make some cornbread?" She made the best cornbread in the world, but Diana pretty good too she said I like I said mother do you feel like it she said well I like I like I make terrible cornbread she said I like cornbread and she said I'd like to fry some potatoes too I like fried potatoes and cornbread with my pinto beans so I said okay I remember on one occasion she loved sweets and I just walked into Walmart the early in the morning, about 7 o'clock in the morning, one morning, and they, had, in the bakery, had just made fresh donuts. And you know how you smell, you're walking at a grocery, you smell donuts are just made? Nothing like that smell. So I, uh, I, uh, I bought a dozen donuts. I'm not a sweet eater. So... I had I had to, that night. Diana had come in and uh, from work and and went through and I went by the kitchen and the box was there and and uh, so I I just looked in the donut box and there were six donuts missing and I asked Diana I said did you eat any donuts she said no so my mom <laughs> ate six donuts and I said mother. I said, you know, you got sugar, and, and I said, you ate six donuts. I did not. I said, well, somebody did, because I didn't, and Diana didn't eat any, and there's six missing, or maybe I did. But uh, when she got so sick, uh, there's nothing they could do for her. 
other than she went into hospice care. And I, it breaks my heart every time I think about this is that they couldn't feed her. They couldn't do anything. She couldn't swallow. She couldn't do any of those things. So basically, when it come right down to it, when they put her in hospice care, and there's no kind word of saying this, but basically she starved to death. You know, that's that's really the way they described it to me. None of us like to go hungry. I don't like seeing anybody go hungry. We need to eat and we need to drink. If we don't eat and if we don't drink, we die. There are a lot of things in life I can live without. I could live without a car. I could live without a television. I could live without a home. But we, we would rather not. But food and water are essential. If you don't eat and you don't drink, the fact of the matter, you're going to die. Psalms 42, 1 and 2, David declares these words. Travis, I didn't give that one to you. I'm sorry. I don't know if you can pull that up or not. But Psalms 42, 1 and 2, David says, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O Lord. My soul thirsts for God. For the living God, when can I go and meet with God? Isaiah said these words in Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2. The Lord is speaking through Isaiah, and Isaiah said, Come, all ye who are thirsty, Come, come to the waters, you that have no money. But this is something that's interesting. He says, come, you that have no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money. And without cost. And spend money on what is not bread. And your labor on what does not satisfy. Listen. Listen to me. And eat what is good. And your soul will delight in the richest affair. It is here. That we see this problem. Jesus saying. Come. And buy. But how do you buy something. When he even declares. You have no money. What's the price? And the price is not in monetary, our, our money, physical money. The price is hunger. While we need the drink that comes without cost and the bread that God offers, we do not always desire it. Our taste have been kept captivated by other delicacies. I'll close on this. In an article entitled Happy Meal Spirituality, John Ortberg writes that when he takes his children to McDonald's, they always want the same thing. If they get it, the trip is a success. Ortberg writes... If not, it's sheer misery. The odd part is that what they are after is not the food. They want the prize. The prize is a pitiful thing. A little piece of plastic toy worth maybe 10 cents. But for the moment, moment getting it is all that matters. Forget the food, 
<coughs> forget the chicken McNuggets. But Ortberg goes on to say that this phenomenon is not limited to children. When you get older, he writes, you don't get smarter. Your Happy Meals just get more expensive. And the real tragedy is for all their costs, they aren't any more satisfying. We hear in Ortberg's observation an echo of the prophet's complaint. Why spend my money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? When we were young and got caught up sneaking a cookie or a piece of candy before dinner, our mother would say, you can't eat that, you'll spoil your appetite. Well, isn't that the whole point of eating? To get rid of my hunger? You'll spoil your appetite. What a curious phrase. You'll spoil your appetite. It implies that an appetite is a good thing. It suggests that the desire to be filled is itself desirable. And Jesus implies the same thing in the beatitude, this beatitude. God sometimes has to help us get over our taste for bread. That is not true bread. And all the things for which we labor so hard that fail to satisfy. The tool he uses, amazingly enough, is hunger. And that was literally true for Israel during the years in the wilderness. But in Israel's case, physical hunger was really meant to teach a spiritual lesson. God says, Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you and to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether, it, whether or not you would keep His commandments. He humbled you, causing you to hunger, and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach that, that man does not live by bread alone. So, I ask you to, today, well, you are you willing to say, Pastor, I'm empty. I'm not ashamed to admit it myself. Forty, I, I, get, I lose track. Six, six, Forty-six years full-time ministry. I'm so hungry for God. I'm as hungry for God as I've ever been in my when I started back. I have a lot of things in my life that, you know, I thought, you know, I don't know why you can't play anymore. I, but Diane and I, we're on a, we're, we're, we're getting ready to downsize, get rid of some things. No need for me. Some of you collect guns, and that's fine. I, I collect guitars. I've got a few guns, small collection. You can only play one, you can only, you really only shoot one gun. Well, actually, you can shoot more than one gun at a time, but you can only play one guitar at a time. But we've looked at things that we have in our life because we're thinking about our future and so on and so forth, so we, we've decided we're going to get rid of some things. I've, I've lived in half a million dollar homes. I've had nice things. I've bought new guitars since I've been here. I've bought new guns since I've been here. And it's nice to look and see, oh boy, there for a moment. That's really nice. That's nice. I, you know, my latest one, is a, it's a beauty. I'll, I'll bring it sometime and I'll play it for you. It's, but, but, you know, then after a while, it just becomes a piece of something that's stuck in a bedroom in a case somewhere that, that you know, very rarely pick up or play or do whatever. Not asking you what, what you have or what you possess. Some of you might live in a nicer home than others. Some of you might have nicer clothes than others. But are you hungry for Him? How many are willing to admit that's my desire? I'm empty and I need to be filled. When when Paul says to the Galatians. That in Galatians chapter 5, be not drunk with wine when it's, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. That he wasn't talking about a one time feeling. 
It's something, you know what's wrong with a lot of Christians? Is they leak. And they feel like that one time experience that happened 20, 25, 30 years ago was enough. But I'm telling you right now, I, I, I'm not ashamed because I know that the only way that I'm going to be, a, be filled here today is to admit I'm empty. How many feel the same way? How many want to be filled today? If you really want to, Susan Page and uh, Kim in particular, I'd like for you to come forward. If you're here today, we're going to pray for Susan. We're going to lay hands on Susan for her mom, Shirley, and for Kim, her mom, Shirley. I'll speak a word to both of you ladies here today. I love you. I think you both have been that you're empty of what it takes to fix your mom. You can't do it. But he can fill it. He's the one that can fill it here today. Karen, would you please go? Anybody else have a need in your heart where you feel empty here today? You just want to be filled. Would you just step forward? Maybe some more. In the name of Jesus.